So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Brunejayi. I am a faculty member in the School of Public Administration at the University of Victoria. And I am uh, the lead for Borders, uh, 21st Century Borders, which is uh, the grant that allows us to uh, give life to Big Lab or the Borders and Globalization Lab here at UVic. Um, and I'm delighted today to welcome uh, Irasema Coronado and Alejandra uh, Josie Ospitz. And I would like also to do a territory uh, acknowledgement. Um, in Canada, we do this regularly um, when we start the day or meetings, and we acknowledge and respect the Lankwangan speaking people on whose traditional uh, territories the University of Victoria stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Vassanek people whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. And I should add to this that I'm speaking from UVic, and this is unceded land, and um, I acknowledge and respect uh, the people whose, um, uh, you know, whose land we occupy, um, and I feel very privileged to live and work here. Um, today we have, uh, on this webinar, uh, we have two amazing speakers uh, for a very interesting book uh, on children crossing borders, Latin American migrant uh, child, um, childhood. And um, I think it's a very important topic. I think it's a, um, a topic that is not very well known. And so I am very grateful to both Professor Coronado Josiovic uh, to be here with us. Irasema Coronado um, um, is the director, is a director and professor in the School of Transborder Studies um, at the University of Arizona. Um, and uh, she has obviously done all her studies. She has a PhD in political science from the University of Arizona. And her area of specialization is comparative politics uh, with research focusing on human rights in the US-Mexico border. She is the author of a number of books of which uh, we can um, mention Fronteras Nomas, for instance, um, and she is uh, the author of a number of articles, for instance, uh, Digame Policy, and politics on the Texas border, and so on and so forth. Alejandra uh, jo Ziovic is a professor and a fellow at the Institute for Language and Literature at the University Estadual do Rio de Janeiro. Uh, she has a PhD from Princeton, and she's published a number of articles and books, which I can't mention here, but certainly she is are going to uh, present us today with this um, new uh, text that they've uh, worked on together, um, and uh, uh, which is called Children Crossing Borders, Latin American Migrants, Childhoods. Um, and with that, Alexandra and um, Erasema, I give you the floor. Thank you very much for being with us today. Well, thank you very much, Emmanuel, for that very generous and kind introduction. Buenos dias, bon dia, guten morgen, uh, bonjour. Uh, I, too, uh, speak to you from Arizona State University in the land that is also unceded. This is the traditional homelands of the Tohono O'odham, the Yaqui, and the Pipash peoples. Uh, we're very proud of uh, the fact that Arizona has 22 indigenous tribes, and we uh, here at ASU are very open and very inclusive in working with our indigenous brothers and sisters. So thank you very much for that opportunity. So let me tell you a little bit about the history of how I got involved in this uh, book on children. Um, back in 2004, uh, this is a long time ago, so I've been working on this for a long time. I feel like a veteran when I start saying these things. In 2004, the New York Times published a picture of a little girl who was at the time five years old. 
Her name is Karen Tepas. And Karen had been deported. And the picture that the New York Times showed was Karen um, being escorted by the Border Patrol to Mexican government officials who work for the an organization or an institute called the Desarrollo Integral de la Familia, which is a, a Mexican government organization that deals with children's issues. And um, I thought to myself that this was just a horrible example, a horrible experience where this poor little girl without her parents being deported from the United States into Mexico. Her parents had paid $7,000 to a smuggler to take them from Arizona to Kansas. The father worked in a meat processing company. Um, the coyote, the smuggler, insisted that the mother and the child travel in separate cars. And at one point when they would buy gasoline, the uh, the people in the car would be um, asked to, um, to get out of the car um, in a remote area. And then they would go buy gas and then come back and pick them up. And in one of those stops, Karen was left behind in the desert. So about 350, 400 miles later, um, when they went to buy gas again, the mother realized my little girl is not in this in the other car. And so the smuggler did have a conscience because he anonymously called the sheriff's department and they found Karen. Uh, unfortunately, the family uh, lost their $7,000. They were all picked up. They were all deported, but the family was intact, which I think is, is a positive outcome in spite of the, the hardship. So I have had the privilege of teaching many, many students, both from the United States and from Mexico, that work in very high-ranking government offices. I've had students in the White House. I have students in Mexico City working for um, different ministries. And I have to say that one of the highest-ranking Latinas um, in the Border Patrol was my student. So I emailed all of them and I said, you know, this is horrible. This is a terrible situation. Uh, if anything, please do something about it in your different respective roles, working for foreign ministries, working for uh, the United States uh, Border Patrol, do something so that this is not uh, a daily occurrence on our border because it was a very heartbreaking story. So that's how I got involved in, in working with children. Um, fast forward a couple of years later, a former professor of mine, Donna Guy, introduced me to Alejandra, who was working on a book on children. And we joined forces and we have wonderful, terrific, talented um, uh, collaborators that have uh, contributed to this edited collection. And so this is how this all kind of got started. And, you know, just yesterday um, I read an article where, you know, in Texas, there are thousands of children still in detention without their parents. Uh, many of them are unaccompanied. Many of them have been separated from their families. And I just keep thinking of the heartache, the trauma, the long-term consequences of the separation that this has on children. And I think that both governments and, 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 and the entire international community needs to do better so that we do not inflict this kind of trauma on children. So having said that, again, I want to thank Emmanuel. I want to thank uh, Maya and the technical team for making this happen. And I want to thank the participants for being here today. And I'll now turn it over to Alejandra, who will introduce uh, the book. And it's been a real pleasure working with all of our contributors. So I'm, I'm very happy that many of them are able to join us today. Yes, thank you so much, um, Yacema, for her introduction and also Emmanuel for his kind words. And also, I would like to thank everyone here. Um, we have here in the presence of professors Navarro and Valet that were uh, contributors uh, to the book. And so they, they will speak afterwards. And so maybe I should start introducing myself. I am Alejandra, uh, as um, Emmanuel said, and I'm an Argentinian living in Brazil. So that uh, is part of um, in, in migrant history that I have that also comes from my family because I, I am uh, the granddaughter of migrants. 
um, my grandfather uh, and my great grandparents um, migrated. Um, so this is part of my family history. So, and today uh, I'm going to speak to you about this uh, wonderful book. So what I, what I would like to start with is to expre express gratitude because a lot, lot of times these kind of projects are not met with enthusiasm. And we were struggling when I met Irasema, actually. So the first uh, thank you is for Irasema <laughs> because she was so um, encouraging and supportive um, of this book, um, Children Crossing Borders, Latin American Migrant Childhoods. And because, and, and also to, uh, to all the other collaborators collaborators because the way in which they have participated in this journey um, with seriousness that is so difficult to find um, nowadays and with uh, rigor and respect. Uh, we all collaborated um, in a very meaningful way. So I will not mention everyone, but I would like the, to, to underline this collaborative dynamic and also express a gratitude because there were also reviewers um and and uh editors um proofreaders at Arizona University Press for example the creator of this beautiful cover as well so i would like to to tell you a little bit about the journey that led to this book uh so it was a dream of mine to write a book about latin american childhood that will be published in english and will give more visibility to to the dilemmas of children in latin america and so I, I'm going to share the presentation with you. Um, um, let me um, make it full screen. Yes. So, um, so when I mentioned this idea to Professor Donna Guys, she suggested that I focus on the topic of borders and connected me with Professor Irasema Coronade, which I need to say was an unimaginable blessing because I learned from her strength, her calmness in moments of stress, her warmth and the way in which difficult tasks with, with her seemed doable. Um, so for me, coming from Latin America in a non-English speaking institution to me, um, to have been met with this, um, to this enthusiasm uh, for a project that was not um, so easy to, um, you know, to understand, to encourage. Um, so Irasema gave the idea, the necessary impulse to come to fruition. Um, so we thought of this book as its main objective is to provide the toolbox for those thinking in between childhood studies and border studies. This is what our collaboration and meeting, um, 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 it was, we thought we thought of it of this toolbox as its strength and its potential. Another important point that we wanted to underscore is the persistence in Latin America and of course in other parts of the world as well of an exclusionary view of childhood that considers that only some young peoples are worth protecting, taking care of, seen as innocent and pure while others are deemed potential threats to the social order, stigmatized as if they were in need of punishment, discipline, and control. Every day we live with that in Latin America, in the news, in communication media, the way in which different children are treated differently. This has to do, of course, with an hegemonic model of childhood and youth, and youth that, were, that was forced throughout the 20th century through laws, public policies, scientific discourses, and that is intrinsically related with a history of imperialism, social, racial, and gender inequalities in Latin America. Even though different conventions and declarations throughout the 20th century have affirmed the rights, views, and status of all children and young peoples, in recent, fissure, in recent years, fissures have become apparent, and it's become even more evident uh, as backlash movements have emerged that reinforce racialization, stigmatization, and exclusion, and distort and corrupt the image of many children that do not fit in the hegemonic model of childhood. This has led to the establishment of barriers to the incorporation of immigrant and refugee children, curbing their rights and restricting their possibilities of integration and becoming rightful members of this civic community. So one of the objectives of this book was to show that the challenges that migrant children today face are not completely new. 
but they are related to the complicated history of imperialism, racial, gender, and social inequalities in Latin America. Uh, another point that is important for us uh, in writing and organizing this, this book is the importance of considering refugee and immigrant children as autonomous agents. And sometimes even the category of a refugee child is very complicated, right? Because no one wants to be labeled as a refugee. Uh, um, and because we found reading and the different wonderful chapters that we're going to present today, that many times independent children migrants that cross borders are on their own and how they make decisions on their own. And they are participants in society and their views also need to be taken into account um, instead of seeing them as purely passive. So children's experiences as migrants, in our view, were capable of questioning hegemonic ideas of childhood as innocent, passive, obedient. So in times of rising xenophobia and prejudice, we also wanted to help. So to provide a, re a real toolbox, right? For policymakers and professionals working with migrant children. So many of the chapters have practical tools and tips and also life experiences of people working with, with, with migrant children and how they can help children in, in their search for belonging, rights, and citizenship, making our educational institutions and societies more inclusive, both in Latin, both in the South and in the North, both in the countries that are receiving those migrants and in those that are, quote unquote, sending them. So this is why intersectionality and the colonial theory are so crucial to this book, um, because this book um, so since the beginning of the process, we needed to think how childhood cannot be thought of, cannot be thought of without considering race, class, gender, geopolitics, and age, right? And so when we think about identities, we, we need to go beyond dichotomic and hierarchical conceptions. So there, the third and last point, um, is, is connected to with, to, to this, um, so I'm sorry, I, I, I should have shown this uh, before. So this is our theoretical frame, right? The inter intersectionality, the colonial theory and transdisciplinarity that were very important for us in thinking about this book. And this, this, I want to make this point because it's very, very important for us in the dynamic, in the collective dynamic that we thought for this book was that it was very interdisciplinary and also decolonial because we wanted to give more visibility to, to knowledge production, theorization and research than in the South. And so this is why our book has a variety of accents, right? Because it doesn't uh, fit into one very easy, uh, maybe uh, to sell frame, because it has different particularities, because it has different accents. Um, and we wanted to showcase uh, that as one of our strengths um, because it's mainly it was mainly written by Latin American and Latino women academics and researchers if you see we are all women and this is not something that we planned right mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we did the call for papers and we were women that were thinking about children and this is not uh, this was not by chance because there is a history of Latino and Latin American women thinking about children in Latin America and in the US. And so women have a very pro a role of protagonism here. Because we come from various linguistic backgrounds, native Spanish, Portuguese, French, and English speakers, diverse academic disciplines, and sharing common interest in the well-being of children. So that is what I wanted to say. I want to express gratitude um, to everyone that's here. And so I'm gonna now, um, maybe um, stop here uh, and let the authors share uh, their views. And we can also, I have a little bit to say about the chapters um, whose authors are not here present and Aida Sema also can comment on those chapters, but I'll, oh, or Aida Sema, do you wanna go by order? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Okay, so let's I'll that. share my presentation again in that yeah. case. Yeah, and I can... Um, Okay, so 
Let me see. You can go to the so next So our book slide. has three sections. Per, uh, do you want to speak, Nida Sema? Go yeah. ahead. So, so this first section um, deals with uh, educational experiences on the borders. Uh, Kathleen, unfortunately, cannot join us today. Kathleen has done a lot of work in Mexico, working in schools where she has found U.S. citizen born children of deportees, families that decided that because they were deported, their children were going to come with them. And so Kathleen looks at the challenges that they face because many of these children do not speak Spanish, or if they do speak Spanish, it's not academic Spanish. They've never gone to school in Spanish. Many of them struggle with the language. They also struggle with integration in the school because they're seen as the other, those who um, uh, went to the U.S. or who were born in the U.S. Uh, many of the children resent the fact that they're in Mexico. They miss their middle schools. They miss their high schools. They miss their friends. They miss their activities. They notice how um, the schools in Mexico do not have the resources that the schools in the United States had. And so Kathleen uh, is looking at that dimension of children struggling uh, to be in, in Mexican schools. And their citizenship is an issue because many of the other children refer to them as gringos or as gringas. Uh, it's a derogatory, it's not really a mean way, but it's it's a it's a way that people refer to Americans in Mexico and uh, the children feel that they're there that othering is going on in educational processes. Some schools have um helped children uh, become better integrated because they become English teachers and the, they teach the other children English, but they're still struggling with trying to learn Spanish. Uh, they also, uh, she also describes um, how the children don't know the Mexican um, Pledge of Allegiance. They don't know the national anthem and how all of that is very foreign to them and the challenges they face. And also she talks about the teachers having to integrate students. Um, the other chapter by Marisa Bejarano Fernbaugh, it focuses on a school in the South that is uh, predominantly um, uh, housing or, or educating a lot of Latin American immigrants. Uh, and she basically has a lot of strategies for teachers on how to work with parents, how to better integrate students. Uh, one of the challenges that they have is that many of the students feel that they migrated to work. And because they have been ended up with the U.S. government, with the Border Patrol, they have to go to school. They're not allowed to work. And so many of them don't want to be in school. They feel that they're not being treated as adults like they would be in their home countries. And they're having to find uh, ways to educate kids that don't really want to be there. She does highlight some success stories of students that have graduated from high school that have gone on to university. But she does provide a, a very strong toolkit for teachers uh, trying to deal with this population. Um, Marta also deals with uh, the same sort of population that Kathleen does on uh, the cultural borders, the children that are in schools in Oaxaca. And it's very much the same, you know, the children of deportees and some of the challenges they face uh, within their own um, communities. And many of them feel, you know, even though we are Oaxacan, we were born in the U.S. and we've never lived here. And so we're not familiar with the language and the culture. And those are the challenges that they highlight in this section. Okay, um, so Alejandra, you can talk about this section. And then Elizabeth yes. is here. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, so this second part um, um, have has three chapters that focus on literature, arts, and culture, and how migration figures in different media in the Americas. So in my chapter, I explore U.S. and Latino, Latin American children's and young literature on migration, looking at the way it can question stereotypes and may function as a tool to combat racism and xenophobia. So basically, um, I, I examine, for uh, it has 
basically three parts. In the first part, I examine children's and young adult literature that deals with border and migration and was um, written by US Latino authors. And I focus mainly on two stories by Gloria Saldúa, short stories by her that are not very well known. And so I analyze them in, in a little bit of detail. And the second part, I look at Latin American children's literature on migration. And I focus on a story by Jairo, 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 with, Jairo with Drago. And it's, he's a Colombian author. And I very, very much recommend that story. It's called um, Eloisa y los Bichos, or Eloisa and the Bugs. It's very, very interesting story. Um, so I also recommend the, that reading. Uh, the third part offers some pedagogical and practical tools for teachers working on uh, migration or with migrant children. And I elaborate on the concept of resilience as a, com a concept that I think can help uh, in connection with children's literature on migration. And I present some activities on another uh, children's work, uh, uh, story that I very much like, and it's by a Puerto Rican children's author named Fernando Pico. Um, so, Elizabeth, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much. As Alejandra was uh, was saying, children are part of the society, participant of a society. So we come from a slightly different perspective. Uh, we um, our research is taking place in a in a somewhat privileged uh, middle school, uh, neighborhood school, a uh, primary school in in Canada in Montreal. Uh, we're not far from the border. We're uh, you know. A 40 minutes away, uh, 40 kilometers away from the border. So, um, uh, we looked into how children were looking at the border, uh, and how they were assessing their own mobility. Um, and it really came up as, um, at the end of a series of conferences we've done with my, uh, research team in primary schools in Montreal, where we discovered that, uh, white children had a very, um, I had a perspective on the border that was tinted by, uh, bordering discourses and policies by the state. Um, and border anxiety was something we did not expect to see because their mobility wasn't infringed. But in fact, they were feeling that they, they had, uh, or uh, me mating, uh, the, 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 their parents' anxiety. Uh, so we, we build up an integrative, um, educational project where, um, the main, um, Educational goals were to improve reading, reading and uh, literacy, appreciation of geography, history. Um, so it was very multidisciplinary and, and global um, aim. And for that purpose, we mobilized a, um, a specific children's uh, literature books book uh, called Le Mur, The Wall, uh, which is uh, telling the story of two brothers that decide to erect a wall in between th themselves. And uh, the wall ends up being totally useless, even uh, 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 negative for the two brothers. Uh, from that, um, the, ch the, the teachers, the professors had them uh, identify uh, synonyms and antonyms of love and separation and borders. And so they were, those were uh, first grade students. So they were learning to, to spell out what is love, what is separation, etc. And, uh, we, we brought in an artist, Anu Kluten, who is using both, uh, Chagall and Gaudi's uh, work in order to design an almost stained, uh, stained glass, uh, wall. Um, and, uh, actually the, the the cover of the book is uh, is building from the the work we've done. Uh, I could share pictures later on if you if you wish. Um, so they built an anti separation wall, um, a, a see through wall, very cor colorful, and we we had that uh, wall uh, exposed in one of our border wall conference uh, in in Montreal, and border scholars could see. The, that uh, actually magnificent wall uh, in the, the the room, and they uh, got to sign a guest book that 
made its way back to the classroom where the kids were then could see the feedback from border scholars and from all, all around the world. And they were, they were building their own geographical literacy through that. Um, so it's, uh, it has been, of course, it's a very different perspective and it's, uh, it's more teaching uh and educational goal that we were uh we had in mind but it really worked well and uh the the border wall that that border wall <laughs> entire separation wall is actually still um uh, in the, exposed in the school um as we speak so it's been almost what uh eight years or five years now but it's still it's still being shown and discussed uh, by uh, by the students uh, and the new generation of primary school students in Montreal. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. So the third chapter um, in this section is by Valentina Glockner Fagetti. Um, it develops a case study of a group of unaccompanied Mexican children who traveled across the Sonoran Desert to understand how borders shape and affect the lives of migrant children. And this is the image where that originated our cover. Am I right? No, it was another one. I can't hear you. No, it was Elizabeth's. Elizabeth. Oh right, yeah, it's yeah, true. Yeah. It's true. I'm sorry. We we right. We we saw and we have many options, but it was Elizabeth's. It's true. Um. So because it, it uh, the field work included an art project in Nogal in Nogales, Sonora, Mexico, in which children depict depicted their understanding of migration through discussion, writing, and art. So, so uh, Valentina discusses the way in which children confront and challenge borders, contributing to their desestabilization, but also to their reification. Um, so, as you see, the three chapters um, were dealing particularly uh, in their intersection between cultural studies, education, anthropology, or ethnography, and it, they showed the importance of studying uh, the relationship between children and cultural discourses on children borders and borderlands, and they problematize the role of borders as physical but also symbolic reality, as well as interrogating and destabilizing the ways in which borders produce children and culture. Um, so uh, our last section um, is the section on the best interests of the child. Um, I think maybe Ida Sema would like to comment on that section, so I'm going to wait for her. Idasema, would you like to comment on the third part? Because I think it, um, I can't, we I'm can't so hear. sorry. I had a situation here I had to address. Um, okay, so this uh, third part is the best interest of the child crossing. And the first chapter is by Patricia Nabucco Murtuccelli, and she looks at um, refugee children in Brazil, and she looks at family reunification in childhoods. And these are children that are coming mostly from Venezuela and then from other countries. Um, and basically, she talks about the bureaucracy. She works with non-governmental organizations that help refugees resettle in Brazil. And I think in the final analysis, I would have to say that there are less to be learned how Brazil deals with uh, refugee children in, 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 in their country and how children are um, have a better way of integrating into Brazilian society in many ways. Um, so I know that uh, Lena is here. No, Emily's here. So Emily, tell us about your chapter, which I have to say was a very um, emotional uh, task to read. Uh, a lot of emotional labor was expended by the research that you and Lena did. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me today um, and for just inviting us to participate in this book. Um, so I want to actually go back to one of the first things you said at the beginning that the book has many accents and talk a little bit about who Lena and I are. Um, we have come together as a team uh, from very different uh, places, very different uh, professions in some way. So, you know, I'm a white native born American um, who has a lot of interest uh, in immigration and immigrant rights, although my immigration story is, you know, over a century old. Uh, Lena is Colombian and immigrated very young, um, I believe at age 19, so not technically a, a minor, but certainly close to it. 
Um, and so we've approached immigration very differently in the sense of our own personal experiences. But then as authors, we come together also um, trying to bridge this gap between academics and practitioners. And so we both have had our hands in both worlds, but I'm primarily an academic. I am a professor of sociology, um, although I have been a social worker working uh, in refugee resettlements and have volunteered in a variety of capacities with immigrant youth over the last decade and a half, <laughs> more or less. Lena is primarily a practitioner, although she does have a master's in sociology where she studied immigration. Um, and, and, and today is working uh, with unaccompanied immigrants uh, as a, um, a, a contractor with the Office of Refugee Resettlement. So we come together uh, again to try to bridge this practitioner uh, academic gap because academics talk a lot and are not always heard. <laughs> and practitioners do a lot and don't always get the opportunity to talk. And so we felt it was important to come together um, to try to both hear uh, or to both speak uh, and listen. So in this particular chapter, we were really interested um, both as research that Lena has started in her graduate program and then my own research uh, as, as a graduate student and now as um, uh, uh, you know, an academic, uh, we were interested in the experience that unaccompanied immigrant kids had have in the United States. Um, and again, we both approached it as researchers, but we were both also working as child advocates with the Young Center for Child Immigrant Rights. And so to try to explain this role very quickly, when a young person immigrates, immigrates by themselves, if they're detained by the U.S., uh, if they're detained by border enforcement, they're placed into a short-term holding facility on the border, and then they're transferred to the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, where they're in these long-term uh, shelters slash detention centers, depending on how you want to frame it. Um, so while they're there, there are social workers who are attempting to reunite them with families or uh, people to host them in the country to help them start with their legal cases. Um, and so there was an organization that was started to, to provide child advocates for some of the most difficult cases. And these are volunteer positions. So the child advocates are volunteers. But the idea is that we go into these offices of refugee re uh, resettlement shelters to help uh, guide the best interests of the children. So Lena and I have both worked as child advocates alongside of the research that we've done. And we were really interested in the view that the child advocate had as really an outsider to the system, uh, that's the role of the advocate is to not actually be a part of the government, but to be an outsider um, and, and in a way providing a watchful eye uh, to the government and, adv and advocating for the best interests. But one thing that we had noted both uh, in the work that we do personally and as we both interviewed other child advocates, was there was a deep sense of ambivalence among advocates. You know, across the board, people advocating for immigrant youth in detention um, care deeply about these issues. Uh, they care deeply about immigrant rights. They care deeply about children, right? You, you can't find an advocate who doesn't have that passion inside of them. And yet when you sit down with advocates, there is ambivalence about the actual work they're doing. Questions about, um, is this right? Right? Am I in the right place to make change? And so in this chapter, what we really wanted to do was provide the lens of the advocate um, with two purposes. One is to show, uh, is to talk more about the stories of, of young people as they navigate the United States uh, immigration system. But then also to talk about this role of the practitioner uh, who often stands very, very close, if not actually inside of a very broken and often violent system. So what does it mean to be a practitioner, right? How close can you stand to that system before you actually become a part of that system, right? So that's one of the questions that we were asking. Um, and I, I will try to be brief here, but essentially we are analyzing what violence looks like in the system. And we found that practitioners as they and child advocates specifically really have a very particular view of violence. Um, and we identify that advocates witness the violence that young people face. Um, they participate in that violence in some ways, which is what causes some of this ambivalence. 
And what we are really trying to argue is that there's an experience of violence as one works uh, in the system. So let me talk very briefly about each of these. When we're talking about witnessing the violence, what we what we saw uh, was that, you know, again, as advocates ourselves, and as we're talking to other advocates, we are really seeing this, what we would call a trajectory of violence. Um, and we got this idea from anthropologists Kate Swanson and Rebecca Torres, who talk about how violence in a home country then leads to uh, migration where there's often more violence um, and an experience on the border where there is, again, this trajectory of, of further violence. We expand that one step further because what we saw is that violence that happened in this one moment of time actually continues. So an example of this would be a young man who isn't his name or his student, I suppose, is Diego. And he had experienced violence in his home. It was a violence by the hands of an older brother. That was not actually the impetus for migration, um, but it was one of the violences that I think is wrapped up in community violence more generally. It uh, Eventually, the community violence broadly led to his migration where he did experience more violence. He was detained in the Office of Refugee Resettlement and spoke to one of the social workers about the violence that he had experienced in his by at the hand of his brother. Because that was family violence, what that meant is that he couldn't be immediately released to his family in the United States. And he responded to that information out of a lot of anger and had actually a violent outburst himself where he started overturning chairs and was very angry and was then told that that angry outburst meant it would be even more difficult for him to leave detention. And so we saw this one incident of violence, incidents of violence, again, with his brother that then expands, it crosses borders, and then it becomes this, uh, the reason that his detention actually lasted for months and months instead of being able to get it immediately. And so advocates would often sit there and, and witness that trajectory in a very intimate way, right? Talking to this young man, hearing this story, hearing him say he wishes he had never told the social worker what happened with his brother because he saw how that multiplied into further harm for him. And so advocates are witnessing that. And in some ways they find that they're also participating, right? And both Lean and I have had this, this sensation as we work as child advocates, where we can see, perhaps in this particular case, that detention is harming the child. And yet we can't do anything about it. Uh, I would talk to many people who say, I had this impulse to just unlock the door right, to just open it and let somebody leave, because I knew it would be better for them to leave, but I didn't do it. And so in some sense, you get this feeling of, of again, participating in violence, that you're culpable for this structure that's detaining children uh, in ways that is, again, exerting that violence. Um, there's all sorts of other ways that we found that in very, very small ways, advocates themselves felt like they were participating in violence. This would be things like, you know, a child telling you the story, a very intimate story of trauma, and then turning that trauma into a productive mechanism, right? I can take this trauma and use it for your legal case. And that, um, that process itself um, feels uh, harmful in many cases, even though it has this outcome, perhaps providing some sort of legal relief, it is a harmful way to engage in a history of trauma. And then the last thing that we talk about is this experience of violence. And I wanna be clear here that in no way are we suggesting that advocates or other practitioners experience violence in the same way that young people do. That's not it at all. But what we found is that as violence unfolds, there seems to be, and, and as you're standing close to these structures that are just violent in and of themselves, oftentimes people working in those structures experience pieces of that violence. And we found this very useful, Lean and I, as we were just talking with one another, because there is an emerging conversation about uh, practitioners and social workers and things like secondary trauma, right? So if you hear these trauma histories, then you start to perhaps have your own trauma responses to them. But we felt like something else was happening here. And we felt like it wasn't just this experience of secondary trauma, although that's certainly important, that practitioners actually also experience pieces of violence. 
And this can be everything from that guilt of, should I just open the door? Why didn't I just open the door? Um, to things like your lack of control in a situation where you're working in a detention center that feels like a prison and you have, um, you know, the very little control over this relationship. The relationships that you do form are often cut off uh, without any um, warning whatsoever. I talk in the book about a, a very deep relationship I formed with a young man who had uh, several notable disabilities and was literally, and I spent months with him, visiting him, pouring um, my, you know, my own work into him. And then he was taken away one day without any, um, I was out of town. I had no chance to say goodbye. There was no warning it would happen. And so there are those little pieces of violence that I think people working in the system itself um, also experience. So to conclude, when we're talking about this violence, I think there's this twofold purpose to it. One is because it help us, helps us to understand um, more clearly what harm looks like in the immigration system and what harm young people face. The second purpose is that it really assists practitioners in identifying some of their own feelings of ambivalence, some of their own feelings of guilt. And I think supporting practitioners who have the best interests of children in mind is part of the work that we need to do to really help children themselves. So I will end there. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, no, your your chapter was very emotionally gripping, I have to say. Um, so my chapter focuses on U.S. citizen children of deportees in Mexico, uh, so close and yet so far, because I focus on children that are on the border, in mostly in Ciudad Juarez. So the first thing I found was a case in 1937. It's the first case of a family facing deportation. It was an American father, a legal permanent resident mother, and five children. The father passed away and the mother went to seek social services and welfare for her children and was turned over to the authorities because as a legal permanent resident, she's not allowed to solicit uh, services from the state. And at that point, um, she uh, was in immigration court and the judge at that time basically said, we need to take into account the best interest of these children and allow for the mother to stay and to receive benefits so that they're not deported to Mexico. So that was the first case that I found. So basing this on the best interest of the child, uh, the, you know, the Article 3 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child um, is really the, 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 um, the framework that sets forth the best interest of the child principle. The United States is a party to the convention, but has never ratified this convention. Mexico has ratified this convention, uh, but, you know, they're, they have, you know, gaps, if you will, in implementing the best interest of the child. So I interviewed a lot of families who had been deported, who had taken their U.S. citizen children with them, and who were now in Mexico. And they articulated the challenges they faced, especially if they did not have dual citizenship for their children. When you're in the United States and you're undocumented and you give birth to a US citizen child, you are highly recommended to register the birth at the Mexican consulate. That way your child has dual citizenship. If you don't do that, and you're deported and you take your child with you, then that child is not allowed to uh, obtain certain benefits. And becoming uh, or obtaining dual citizenship in Mexico is far more complicated and far more costly. If you do it at the consulate, it's $14. If you try to do it from Mexico, it is like $400. And so one of the things that I learned from these families were the challenges they had registering their U.S. born children in schools, getting vaccinations, getting health care through uh, the Mexican government system because they were not because they were not Mexican citizens. So that became a challenge for them. Many of these children 
wanted to attend schools in the United States. And some of them do, if they have a family member who accompanies them across the bridge, drops them off, takes them to school, and then takes them back home to Mexico. And um, that is something that all the parents wanted. They wanted for their children to be educated in the United States, and they felt that school districts needed to provide um, transportation, accompany them from the bridge to the schools, and then bring them back home uh, to Mexico in the afternoon. It's one of the recommendations that I make in the book. Um, the other uh, recommendation that I make in the book is the need for binational visiting spaces where people who, for whatever reason, cannot cross the border, can meet in a dignified manner, can meet for an hour, can meet in a place that offers, you know, space and dignity and privacy for them to interact. Uh, and that's not possible. That's something that families have requested, a binational meeting space, uh, because right now the only opportunities that they have to see their relatives on the other side are these uh, hugs across the border events that are sponsored by certain non-governmental organizations in El Paso in collaboration with the Border Patrol and Homeland Security. And families can come together for three minutes and they can hug, they can um, you know, visit, but it's only a three minute visit. And then they need to each go back to their respective side of the border. So that's something that they really advocated for was um, opportunities to visit their, their families on, other si on each side of the border. Um, the last chapter is, is a very touching chapter because it deals with Bolivian children who have been exploited in Argentina as, as laborers. And they work in, in workshops, in, um, in the garment district, in vegetable farms, in stores, and as domestic workers. And um, Marianes talks about the Argentinian government's role in protecting these children. And then she examines the need for children uh, to go work and help their families in Bolivia. It's a very, very gripping and touching um, situation of child labor exploitation in that part of the world. So that concludes uh, our book presentation. Uh, we look forward to your comments, to your ideas, and to how we can move this work forward in the policy world and make some meaningful changes. And I want to thank all of you for, for joining us. <music>